Um, so I'm Elizabeth Barnard. I'm from the University of Southern California, and I'm here to moderate a discussion with some of our esteemed uh, colleagues in the <laughs> field of emergency medicine qualitative research. We have Dr. Zach Mizell and Dr. Kristen Rising and Dr. Megan Rainey, and they're alphabetical there. There's no, <laughs> that ranking has nothing to do with precedence. It's just alphabetical. Um, so um, I think you're all here because hopefully you're interested in uh, putting together a qualitative research project and you want to work on your methods for it a little bit, um, or you're from uh, my institution and you're here to say hello. So thank you for that too. Um, uh, none of us have commercial relationships to disclose um, and various, I think, federal funding sources that generally uh, are not enough money to be doing the projects we want to do. So. Um, <laughs> So I've heard a lot of critiques about qualitative research methods over the years. Um, one of them actually came last night at my class reunion where one of my colleagues, who is now a venture capitalist, told me that uh, the only way I could make qualitative methods uh, more rigorous was to make them more objective. Um, and I said, Andrew, you don't know what you're talking about. Go have another drink. Mm -hmm. Because I think that there's an important thing that we have to acknowledge when people say things like that is that their impression is that qualitative research is just describing anything that happened and that anything goes. Um, that replication is impossible and that there's limited generalizability and that there's a lot of researcher bias in anything we do in qualitative research. Okay. So he literally was asking me why I even bother doing this. Um, and I think that there's a lot we gain from qualitative research that makes it worth going through the effort of developing a rigorous research program. Um, we can learn a lot about the how and why of behaviors and intentions. I think we can hear about silenced voices that may not be um, represented well in terms of normal survey scales. It can help you over overcome the dissonance in your results. So oftentimes we'll end up with an analysis where our numbers don't seem to be coming together in a coherent way and we want to understand why that happened. Um, and honestly, just knowledge. I think everyone in this room I'm going to say is a certified nerd because you're here on a Friday afternoon learning about research methods. So uh, the three of you are just kind. You're not nerds. Um, <clears throat> but. But there's a certain amount of just like interest in broad and rich knowledge. So are, there are different kinds of knowledge that we gain. Um, so some terms that you'll see when you're looking at qualitative inquiry are inductive versus deductive approaches. And that's basically are you coming in with a question you want answered or are you developing your knowledge from the data you're looking at? That's a very brief discussion. You can also read about it for like 500 pages, but we'll go with that. Um, and then also thinking about reality being constructivist versus positivist, right? So is reality something that our brain constructs or is reality something that is there and is true for every person and is the same and we have to get to that trueness in, in the end? So constructivist reality um, is really what we're using as our model of truth when we're looking at qualitative inquiry. Um, there are a few papers that can help us think about qualitative inquiry and find really rigorous and excellent methods to help us develop findings that are worthwhile. Um, so these are uh, the three papers that um, I found to be most helpful when I'm developing a project. So we're going to go through those three papers and then we're going to open up to question and answer and all of those questions you have about your research protocols hopefully we'll solve in 40 minutes or less. Um, so the first paper, uh, the Gubin Lincoln paper, is a kind of a seminal paper in qualitative inquiry. Um, and they described trustworthiness. Okay, so trustworthiness of findings. So a lot of times when we talk about quantitative research, we talk about the rigor of the methods. And in qualitative inquiry, we're talking about trustworthiness. Okay, and that includes uh, several domains, but the four biggest ones for um, general evaluation is credibility, confirmability, transferability, and dependability. Um, that is a Mac to PC issue right there, but uh, prolonged uh, credibility is the confidence and the truth of your findings. Okay? How accurate do you feel your, your findings are? So are things, there are things you can do to improve your credibility. Okay? One is prolonged engagement, um, which can be difficult in the type of work that we do in emergency medicine. Um, but to really know the setting that you're working with or the patients that you're working with or the providers that you're working with, to have spent more than a couple weeks with them. Um, and persistent observation, right? So it's not just the one time you went in and came out. You're going to go in, you're going to get an idea of your framework, you're then going to proceed with your project, right? And then you stick with it. You don't just leave when your project's over. Like you should really continue to be engaged with the population. 
Um, triangulation is taking um, a qualitative um, uh, finding and triangulating it with either other qualitative findings or with quantitative findings, and, and those two points of the triangle help you find what the truth is in the middle. Another common tool is peer debriefing or member checking um, to take your findings and to make sure that they're accurate with, um, or they represent what the actual participants believe is true. I think negative case analysis is something that we tend not to do, right? So we have our overall themes and findings and then thinking about when does that not represent the reality that I'm looking at. Um, referential adequacy and member checking uh, Peer debriefing and member checking tend to overlap a little bit there. The next domain is transferability, and that's findings that are applicable in other contexts, and that can be a limitation of qualitative inquiry. The ways that you can address this are through really giving a thick description of what you see, and so thick description means describing your setting, describing your <laughs> participants, describing everything that happens, not just what they said in the interview or what they had recorded by an, op and by an observer. And so then I think you get to issues of like, what do you include at that point and how do you keep it within a manuscript word limit? Um, and hopefully we'll have some suggestions about that at the end. Um, but how do, you, how do you keep those archived if you don't put them in your manuscript? Um, because that's, that's important information to have. You know, if you're talking about trauma surgery providers, it matters what kind of hospital you're at. It matters what the other resources are. Like those are all things that affect how well it transfers to other settings. Um, Dependability is the consistency and repeatability of your findings. And generally that um, is proved when you prove credibility, but there are some other techniques like enter rate of reliability when you're doing code books. Um, and then an inquiry or external audit. Um, and I think that, I'm not sure how many of you do audits of your data separately from your own. Um, that's more common in sociology and ethnography and less so in medical research, but it's something to think about. Um, and then maintaining an audit trail, which is um, probably the most important thing you can do to ensure your dependability. Um, confirmability is how much the findings are shaped by respondents' data rather than your own biases. And that's a really tough one, right, because you have to actually think about the decisions you make all the time. Um, and this is where memoing and reflexivity is important in keeping track of the decisions you make and what part of your data drove your, uh, your analysis decisions. So that's really our audit trail, right? That is our, our check on our qualitative research. Um, it can be paper, it can be electronic, it just has to be there. And all of the decisions you make about data and analysis need to be included in that, and it should be timed and dated. Right? And you should be able to go back later and understand why you went a certain path in your inquiry. Um, and I think a really important part is to keep track of dissension. Like, you know, if there's two or three of you working together in a group, what was the one that got voted down? You know, what, what was important there? Because that might come up again later in your inquiry and it's important that you kept a record of that so you can go back to those thoughts. Um, and you just really have to keep it organized in some way so that later you can go back to it. Um, the next paper that we'll talk about very briefly, um, because you can also find these, they're all freely available on ResearchGate <laughs> or, or PubMed, um, are the eight criteria for excellence. Um, we're gonna go through them one by one, so. Um, a worthy topic is probably the most important part of qualitative inquiry, right? There's lots of things that I personally find interesting that no one else in the world finds interesting. And so that's probably not a good qualitative inquiry project. It's something fun for me to read about or think about, but to actually pursue as a research topic isn't appropriate. Well, not a good use of my time. All right, so making sure that it's something that's worth the participant's time of being involved in your researcher assistance. Um, ethics really involves planning, like have a plan for every eventuality. Um, we've talked a little bit about rigor already, so we can um, think about sincerity, which especially is about uh, biases and your reflexivity journal. And then the credibility, which we've discussed a little bit as well. So th there is some overlap between these two frameworks. Um, resonance uh, is where I personally find the most difficulty because it's about presenting your ideas in a way that other people find aesthetically pleasing. Right? So, either in terms of visual pre presentation or the words that you use to describe it, um, and then significant contribution and meaningful coherence. How do, those, how do your findings apply to other people and how do they come together in the context of what's already there? Um, and so this is more when you get to the writing and the dissemination portion of it, but it's important to think that through when you're designing your study as well. 
Um, and then the core guidelines were the last paper that I think you should all read before you finish designing a qualitative study. Um, they are a set of guidelines for qualitative inquiry um, focused on interviews and focus groups. Um, so that's um, not so much for ethnography or other types of qualitative projects. Um, but there are three domains to think about, your research team, the study design, and your analysis and findings. Um, really recording who did what, right? Making it clear what training was available. Was this someone who's done lots of interviews before? Or was this their first time? Um, and then how they relate to the patients that you're interviewing are the providers. Are they part of your institution? Are they the doctor that was providing the care in the emergency department? There's a lot of things that might influence what they respond to your interview prompts with. Um, your study design, obviously, these things are probably what you're thinking through, but making sure you report them when you're writing up your findings is important um, because it brings clarity and transparency to what you're presenting to other people. And then in your data collection, really being clear about what happened. You know, did you follow an interview guide? Um, I think you should include that as an appendix in any study you do. Um, did you do repeated interviews or was it just a one-time engagement? Um, what other things did you do? Did you do audio recording or just or visual recording, right? Because there's different things you get out of those different types of recordings. Um, data saturation and what you mean by data saturation is important. Um, a lot of people say well, we, got, we reached data saturation at, you know, four interviews. So like, I'm probably not at four interviews, right? So tell me what you mean by that. Like, I didn't find new codes or, you know, I didn't find new codes after three interviews, right? Or after the one more interview, I didn't do more. Um, and then being clear about whether it was transcript based or not. Um, that's a pretty easy slide and I'm already going over my portion a little bit so we'll skip that one, sorry. Uh, data collection methods are important because it applies to how well your theoretical framework um, fits your actual findings. So just being clear about these things, making sure it's clearly listed when you write it up and if you're putting together a proposal. Um, and then uh, your analysis approach and making sure that your analysis approach mat matches your data source. Um, it's probably not appropriate to do, you know, an uh, interview study and then try to make it about, uh, you know, a case study analysis alone. Like that's, that's a type of data collection method that requires more than just interviews, right? It requires document review, it requires, um, you know, different types of observation. Um, so you just make sure that your theory matches what you're actually doing. Um, your data sources for interviews are really your participants and your interviewers and making sure that your interviewers are extensively trained. Right? Um, one test interview with you before they go off to talk to participants is probably going to result in the first 10 interviews they do being inadequate. Um, so you need to really think it through and make sure that you're ready for this person to go out and find participants. Um, and an iterative process is always going to be best, right? For qualitative inquiry, sometimes we don't know what we want to know until we start. And so making sure you have the opportunity to alter your interview guide, alter your data collection forms, you know, have a chance to move to different settings or to find other participants is really important for qualitative inquiry. And that's where you get the richness in your data. Um, but you can't forget your analysis plan. And so making sure you know what your analysis plan is when you're at the beginning of the project will enhance your findings. It'll make your findings more credible and clearer when you're trying to present them. Um, and it's also important that when you deviate from a standard protocol, you keep track of what that is. You know, it's not wrong to change the qualitative analysis you're going to do from what's been done by other researchers, but you do need to be clear about what you did differently. Okay. So thank you for your patience. That's great. Um, so this part, that was just to get a little brief and read those papers later because I think that um, 10 minutes about them is probably not sufficient to really change everything that you're <laughs> going to do. Um, but it kind of gives you an idea of what we're looking through. Um, but right now we have the opportunity to speak to some experts who've completed a lot of projects successfully um, and can help us work through some of the issues we have in our own work. Um, so if people are comfortable coming up to the microphone, um, that would be helpful because then it can be part of the recording to review later. Research. Like how much uh, support did you feel, or like, before you could do this on yourself, or maybe you still have? That's a great question. Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, well, I guess I'll, I'll, we can go down the line. We'll start this way and then. All right, so I started doing qual um, with uh, kind of after I finished my fellowship. So it was not part of my fellowship training. It was actually my first kind of large grant included my, I got a, a research training grant from the SAM Foundation and I included a qual part in it. Um, somehow they approved it despite like having actually no qual methods written into the grant and I went to try to do it based off of the books that I'd read and the articles that I'd read and I realized I had absolutely no clue what I was doing. Um, I was very lucky to have another junior researcher with me at the time who I shared an office with who had just gotten her K who also had written in qual stuff, also had no idea what she was doing. So together we went and found this amazing mentor who um, did a weekly seminar on qualitative methods. We attended her seminar, she took us both under the wing, her wing and kind of walked us through how to do it. Um, and uh, Esther and I kind of spent the next year going back and forth trying to figure out how the heck to write an interview guide, what does coding mean, and then we'd get to go to this weekly seminar and work it through with our senior mentor. Um, that first project took absolutely forever because we had no idea what we were doing. Um, it has become much easier, but I still continue. So one of the nice things now be having more external grant funding. Um, although I love doing qual myself, I also don't have a lot of time to do it deeply myself. And so most of my studies, I write in a person to do the qual, to do, you know, and I'll work with them, but I am not the person sitting and coding all the transcripts myself at this point. Um, I, I usually work with people and I, I actually have a paper in my inbox that I have to look through that my research assistants worked with my qual, co -I, and that now kind of we're going through and we're kind of doing the, the theme, we've, we've done kind of the higher level stuff together and now we're kind of starting to write up the paper. So is that, uh, yeah, that's kind of my short version of my story. Yeah. Uh, my first qual study I did during my second year of fellowship, uh, I guess in 2013, I was at Penn, I went into a health services research fellowship. I definitively was gonna be like a numbers big database person, pretty much majority of my work I thought. But I realized that all the questions that I wanted to ask or look at just didn't exist in large databases and really needed some exploration. It was new topics, things that we just didn't have, or just the types of data you don't get in administrative data sets. Um, and so I, while it wasn't part of really my formal training in my classwork in any kind of real applicable way, I was lucky enough to be at Penn while a fellow, so I could pretty much go to anyone and say, hey, I want to work on a project, any chance you can mentor me, and like it was very open doors. And so I worked with some colleagues, um, uh, medical sociologists, sociology is her background, as well as, um, uh, no, Judy, Shay. Uh, so worked with a colleague, and then Penn actually had what's called a mixed methods research lab, so a whole bunch of people who work on coding and things, so worked along with them and got a lot of hands-on support from them doing my first project. Then, you know, left and went to Jefferson and the next year was like, oh my gosh, I'm all alone, I kind of have to run this, right? And have started to set up an infrastructure of, yes, I kind of work on the high level with people, but a lot of the coding and such gets kind of led by a qualitative trained research coordinator now because it does, it takes a lot of time, but the first project really took a lot of hand-holding. It's so much fun. And we are all still learning, right? Yeah. We're like looking at stuff mm -hmm. and Zach and I are like, hmm, maybe we should take a qual methods course sometime. Because <laughs> well, right? like, it's I've like, never taken a formal course in it, oh, right? It's fun. learned from mentors and then kind of learned as you go and hearing about things and saying like, wow, those are some great, ooh, we should incorporate that. It is a continuous process of refinement. Yeah, I agree. I think, uh, I mean, the number of times I've had that conversation with, with colleagues about how we need to like re-up on our statistical training every like three years it feels like because uh, this, I sort of, sort of feel the same thing a little bit with qualitative research. But I would just, uh, Chris and I probably have a lot of overlapping experiences since we both were at the same shop. Um, the mixed methods research lab that exists at Penn but I know does exist at other, pla or, uh, obviously different, named other, other things but um, they do exist. Uh, many uh, academic institutions will have uh, a lab or a, uh, mm -hmm. a center that kind of focuses on met the qualitative methods and is often a s structured as a service center, mm -hmm. which is what the MMRL is at Penn, run by an anthro medical anthropologist. Um, and we're lucky enough to, and so I, re, I definitely recommend seeing if you can find the equivalent if, if you're at a shop that's 
big enough or maybe even in your, you know, maybe even go outside. Um, I actually know the MMRL at Penn does contract with investigators outside of Penn um, to do, conduct uh, qualitative research because they're, um, they're experts at it and so you can write them into your grant and, um, uh, and they will help you from basically lots of different levels of, of, uh, of, of qualitative um, inquiry they can help with. They can help you design your interview guide um, but, and let you kind of run with it. They can actually give you coders. Um, they can help you analyze your data. They can do the whole thing um, for a lot of money. Um, but <laughs> they will um, inevitably for people who are just getting started um, offer uh, uh, sort of, you know, if, the, if it looks like it's a promising idea or a grant, they will help you kind of do it uh, on, the, on the cheap. And then, um, uh, so for me, uh, what was really I would say this is probably what I've heard from you, all you guys, and it was certainly my, my experience as well, is that you can't read about it and do it, mm. or even sit in a class and, do, and go off into the world and do it without sort of watching it happen. Or it's, it's more about, you know, sort of experiential learning, I would say. So my first experiences in touching and diving into this were, uh, were with a lot of hand-holding and with um, folks who had done a lot of it and I sort of sat back and watched. It was my idea, but they kind of really helped me run with it and then I learned um, so much so that now I don't um, always use the MMRL, although I try to since I feel very kind of dedicated to them, at least to the director who is the one who kind of introduced me, but I can, I can now execute um, uh, a project without having a contract with, uh, with this sort of this service center. We also totally answered that like all Qual's interviews. I think each one of us were like, oh yeah, the interview study we did. Mm -hmm. And then there will be other things, right, where maybe someone did some surveys and you asked them open-ended questions, but you have free text data in there, or maybe you're running focus groups, or maybe you're doing other things, right? So like, it kind of is like, there. I think even probably us at times, there are like different scenarios where it kind of feels like our first, and you apply the methods in as you can, and you kind of seek consultants of people who have done like stuff who either you know in your institution or you've seen in other kind of, um, you know, publications or things and, you know, reach out and continue to build teams as we need to adapt, I would say. Yeah, so I actually think that's a really important point is that there, you know, and Liz mentioned this in her wonderful presentation, but there are different types. Uh, there are different purposes to doing qualitative analysis. And before you start to do a qual study, the first question is like, why am I doing qual? Mm -hmm. And like, what, what is the point of my trying to get kind of stories or lived experience? And then that, that, that then guides both how you design the data collection, but also how you um, design the analysis. So as an example, um, I'm going to give two examples of two different qual studies um, that I have going on right now. One is I'm collecting social media data from kids and looking at how they experience violence and bullying in social media. And so the way that we're doing our, the, like, so how, so, you know, my question is what are, what's like kids lived experience of bullying and, and violence online. And so I did interviews with kids, but then I'm also downloading their social media data and going through and coding it. And so like totally different from doing like interviews, right? Like it's just like this whole different thing and we're having to, and we're kind of complementing it when she talks about triangulation, we're complementing it with like semantic analysis where you look at like the frequency of words and what their meaning is and stuff like that. So that's one example. Another example is I was doing um, a technology design and I wanted to use agile methods, which is this like classic technique in the tech world, but that we don't use a lot in medical research. So like really quick, iterative, change, 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 change. Qual was important to that, like user experience, user design testing, but I didn't have the time to do transcripts and do the classic kind of ethnographic, anthropologic approach. So we use something called framework analysis or like a framework matrix where basically I have this Excel sheet with like, the study ID number, the main topics I'm touching on, and after each interview, my RA fills it in. And then we go back and we have ways of like checking to make sure that we're accurate, like as we're writing up the paper, but it was like a, just a totally different, we had a very specific purpose for using Qual, which was to get really quick feedback on whether people liked the intervention or not, and what was it that we needed to change. And we did it in these really quick, rapid cycles, and used just a very different type of analysis that I had never used, but this is why I work with a great Qual person, and she's like, this is the perfect technique. I'm like, awesome, right? So I think, and there's like, we all have other, I mean, some of the stuff that Zach does around narratives is like. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think you know, Liz pointed this out in the beginning that qualitative research is, you know, or uh, fundamentally a, you know, uh, a narrative-based approach. The, one of the reasons that I actually, like, I don't think I knew, I, I don't think I understood. <laughs> understood that other than I had heard people say that and I was interested in studying narratives like not as a methods but as an intervention and so when people talked about qualitative methods as being narrative based it sort of was like oh I guess I should use a narrative based approach to study <laughs> narrative. Um, but it did make sense um, for many, for in many ways um, but that was, it was kind of a weird backdoor way into, into me exploring this sort of topic. I, I did want to point out real quick, so Megan was talking about the, the technology project. So we talk, I briefly touched on like inductive versus deductive approaches and I don't think either one is better, but I think that that was an important point you brought up, like thinking about that to start with, like she knew what she wanted to know. She wanted to know what parts do I need to change to make it better, not what is the world experience of user design. I've involved. done those before, and yes. Those, <laughs> you know, and those are good too, but they're, they're, different, they're yeah. different goals and different approaches. So taking a little bit of time at the beginning to think through those goals will save you a lot of time at the end. Well, and one of the interesting things is that in the same project, sometimes you can move from one to another. And I know we've had this conversation with some of my earlier kind of tech design projects. You know, I start my, you know, you're going to do, you know you're going to do 20, 30, 40 interviews. Maybe the first 10 are more kind of trying to get the lived experience and to help guide your questions. And then it moves into a more I know what I want to know phase. Mm -hmm it's okay for qual to change across yeah. the, the, it's the process of doing it, yeah. It complicates the write-up. Mm, yeah, no, Sometimes. as long as, yeah, I'm good <laughs> at making it not, yeah, no, it could, it could. But, well, I think that's important too for what we're talking about is to have the same terminology about that process, right? So an iterative adaptation of the interview guide based on an iterative analysis is appropriate, and, but, but like you can't say I changed it because the answers looked weird, right? Like so using some like some commonly accepted terminology will help you with your proposals getting funded and then your manuscripts getting published. Um, and, and some of that is having I think probably a senior mentor or someone who looks at it and they're like we don't say that. You know, like it's like how you learned how to pronounce all those words in med school, right? Like someone sat you down and they're like that's not how you say that word, right? So, and so, and part of it is important for, for research methods as well, like someone needs to teach you these things, or you can learn yourself, it just takes longer that way. Yes. So. so some, we actually, Kristen and I are coming off of the last session was about peer review and yeah. publishing, and Kate actually asked us the wonderful question of talk to me about publishing qualitative mm -hmm. research, which I think is an important yeah. thing to discuss. Mm -hmm. So I'll actually let Zach start this one. I do get, I, I'm one of the uh, um, editors at Academic Emergency Medicine, I do feel like a lot of the qualitative papers do come my way. Um, <laughs> we need more Thank qualitative God. researchers on yeah. the editorial board. Um, you know, it's interesting. I think that, uh, so there's a lot of qualitative research that's out there. Um, and uh, it, uh, and there's definitely a trend towards more publication of high quality qualitative research, I think, in emergency medicine in general and medicine um, specifically. Uh, there's no question that uh, they, um, the, some of the, so I actually would go back to uh, w the COREC paper that um, uh, Liz mentioned, uh, which is a really uh, important tool, even though it's, so COREC is part of the, um, uh, it's part of the Equator Network, which is, um, if you guys don't know, you should um, look it up because it's actually um, uh, a clearinghouse for reporting guidelines for any type of research. Well, not for any type of research, yeah, pretty but much. pretty much it gets the big ones. Um, so trials, uh, many of you are familiar with consort, et cetera. So Equator is, uh, COREC is the qualitative equivalent, I think, of of consort, right? Um, and it's designed to be reporting guidelines, um, which is funny to me because uh, it's it, it's um, it's about what needs to go in your manuscript or what you need to present. But if you've already done your study and you didn't do the things that are on the checklist, <laughs> then it's gonna you're not gonna be able to report those things, right? And so it really shouldn't be reporting guidelines. It should be 
like design your study guidelines a little bit. Um, I mean, there's probably, it's, it's, it's a little rigid and you don't have to do everything, but you should look at the checklist because I can tell you if you submit a qualitative paper mm -hmm. to a, 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 academic emergency medicine, uh, we will ask you to submit a correct checklist uh, along with uh, that paper, um, which we don't, it's, it can go in the appendix. You don't have to have to put it in the appendix, but you have to, we, we will ask you to take a look at it so that we can see which of these uh, uh, items you were able to accomplish. It's okay if you didn't do every single one. Not every item in the checklist um, applies to every single type of qualitative research. So just be aware of that. So, um, but that, that being said, it's really useful when you're setting out to design your study to, be, to, to think about what you're going to be asked um, at the publication uh, side. I also will say that this question about rigor um, is, and sort of this, I wouldn't call it an offensive posture, but this sort of like qual versus what's more rigorous, I mean, Liz, you, I think you touched on it really nicely in terms of uh, um, basically setting out and framing the fact that there's nothing inherently non-rigorous about uh, qualitative research, but it, um, it, the sort of truth, truthiness, I would say, of, of qualitative research often emerges in, uh, in, from what, from, from the content that you're discussing, right? And so, for example, when we see a quantitative paper and we're going to basically apply our lens to identify, okay, what are the potential sources of bias that could actually make this quantitative paper wrong, right, or inaccurate. And in qualitative research r r papers, at least when I read them, I'm going to be looking at the sort of the content because the, the, um, the, the content that emerges from the analysis is inherently truthful, right, because it's coming from your, directly from your data in some ways. They're quotations or they're, um, uh, and they're, or they're um, snippets. Uh, and what, they, what you're looking at is, um, is are, are, real, are real people's perspectives on real issues, right? And, um, and so that is, uh, and if, so if that's meaningful, and feels meaningful, that's kind of going to be the, the way in which uh, we're going to start taking a look at your, uh, at your paper as to whether or not it's pu publication worthy. And then we're going to go and apply, um, apply some of these, I think, you know, objective measures to whether you accomplished your study well. Um, so I'll stop there because I know you guys do a lot of reviews as well. But for me, I would say, like, that's what you're going to be emphasizing what people sort of the the range of ideas that emerged in your in your paper and the richness of the of the stories and the narratives that come out and that's going to actually get people excited or not. Um, probably the main thing I would add to that I have not from I've reviewed a lot of papers but I sparkling don't think I've reviewed that many qualitative papers. Hmm. And I just started. <laughs> I'm going to change that. As an editor. <laughs> well, I just started as editor of Annals. Now I feel much I'll more comfortable. I'll still saying, send no. you things. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I think the primary thing that like a lot of people I think decide to do qual some qualitative work because they f think it's easier and like don't feel comfortable with mm. quant. So and then there'll just be a lot of studies where like you could ask any question of anything of anyone and Liz touched on this with the like is it a worthy topic and said like you have to make sure it's interesting to you but I would go the step further and make and it passed is it interesting because there are even a lot of just interesting questions we can ask but like have some so what attached you're either working to inform the next thing that you want to be addressing or there has to be a so what to it I think to um, be appealing to most people. And then that gets to the end, you know, of the kind of end analysis when you're talking about what is this contribution. Like there needs to be some sort of kind of thought contribution. Mm -hmm. And so making sure that you have the so what, right? Like the studies that I've done in general are to then inform a next step, right? Like just got a trial funded that we decided what the interventions were going to be based on the qualitative interviews that we initially did, right? So you're trying to figure out what do these patients need or what is that next thing we're going to do. And so um, I would say from that perspective that making sure you have that is going to inform then your, 
kind of likelihood of um, you know a quality submission. The other thing that if anyone came to our manuscript writing talk yesterday that Judd Hollander and I gave, his whole shtick on this, which I can't say I quite really stick to, but like he says, write write your paper before you do the study. But it gets to Zach's point of like you can't once, do that with quality. No, yeah. no but no. some of them, right? So his points of the background of the why and the methods, right? Mm -hmm. But as you're writing them out, which makes you, which maybe you don't do that, but it's back to the point of like, you can't do the, you can't achieve the core guidelines if you already did the study and you didn't do it and you mm -hmm. didn't even look. But thinking through those and sketching through what your methods are to think to the guidelines, you may identify some holes of like, oh gosh, we hadn't considered this or what are we gonna do here? And so being very thoughtful about the planning, right? A good paper cannot rescue a bad study. Yeah, you have a question? Okay, and then and then I'm going to touch off of a couple things that she said, but go ahead first. Okay, yeah, uh, this all really resonates with me. I actually I think I'm in the box of coming from a quantitative and data background, yeah, and starting a project where I've come through the early stages of the iterative process and realized that this is absolutely more appropriate for a qualitative approach. Aww. We've all been there. I don't have the same skill set in qualitative that I have in statistics, and so. I think my question as I'm thinking about how to move forward with this is at what stage in this iterative process do you think about an initial submission knowing that as you move forward you can improve, you know you know, have new questions, you have other things, but when do you pull the trigger and say, okay, what we've done is actually quite good and is interesting, which I think I feel confident that it's, it's worthy, it's something that people will want to know, but there clearly is further to go with it. Sure, so I'll say that. if you're still collecting data, that's probably not the right time to publish because that says to me that you haven't fully answered your question yet. Um, I think, you know, their points about, uh, amazing, of course, uh, and totally agree. Um, but I think kind of when you get at that novelty question, if you publish now and then you want to publish another paper, like, why, you know what I mean? It's that like so what thing. So I would say kind of do the, and, and I'll give an example um, of actually, so one of my mentees is in the audience. We did this delightful study last summer um, that uh, was kind of a first part of a multi-stage project that's just not ready for publication yet because we need to do a second phase of data collection. Now could we try to publish the first stage? Possibly. Um, but it would be in a really low impact journal. And then what happens to the second phase, which is super interesting, like maybe I get two publications out of it, but like it's not done yet. There's also this idea of saturation that Liz mentioned, which is a not perfect concept by any means. But like if you're still collecting data and getting new ideas, then again, you're probably not done yet. Um, the, the only time that I think it's okay to publish part and then go and collect more qual data and publish another, there's really like very distinct stages. But even then, so like I'm doing, um, actually I've just submitted an intervention development paper where we had like f um, four waves of study design and could I have published after the first wave? Well, so actually I did have a publication after the first wave that was about kind of the methods, but I didn't do like a publication on the outcomes until I was done with the full intervention design, if that makes sense. So I think that if you feel like you're still collecting data, that's probably too early to publish. Does that answer? Yeah, no, I mean, it's definitely too early now. I'm just thinking, okay, like, I'm going to probably lose a good number of papers in the next year or two so do your analysis, right? So do one of the beautiful, one of the, the best things with qual is that you should be doing your analysis, mm -hmm. right? Like as you're going, maybe not after every single interview, you should be doing your debrief after every interview or after every observation or whatever, but like after every couple, every two to three, you should be doing some sort of analysis and revising your code book or kind of doing something like that's part of the qual process is that it like has this like beautiful generative aspect to it. And as you're going through that, that's when we talk about saturation. It's like really the idea of saturation is like you've really done kind of, and, and, and part of it too is to make sure you've got those outliers. And you mentioned doing kind of the negative case analysis, but one of the things that I look for as a decision editor or as a reviewer is making sure that you have a variety of people. So you've very purposefully gotten some people who are different from the others. So, you know, oh great, I have a whole bunch of attendings. 
well, do I have old attendings and new attendings? Do I have attendings that trained at the site and off the site? Jeff Klein said in the last talk, well, I won't accept a qual paper that's not done at multiple institutions, which I think is baloney. Multiple but hospitals. Multiple hospitals, fine, whatever. That doesn't necessarily matter. Um, but you do, want, um, you do want those outliers. You do want those deviant cases. Um, and, and you want to present the full variety of it. And so if you feel like you're at saturation, if you feel like you've coded two interviews and there's nothing new coming out of it, I will often still push to do another one or two with people that are really, really different. So let me find my LGBTQ, let me find my Pacific Islander in, who lives in Rhode Island, like there's like six, but like, you know what I mean? There's like, let me try to find the person that doesn't fit into the rest of my patient population and make sure that I really do have saturation there. Does that make, yeah. I'm going to so I'm going to repeat that for the recording because I think there's a lot of people that would have been here if they were more awake. Um, so I, um, the question is, um, what's our responsibility about thinking about the impl implications of our findings and what we put out there? Is that we good some policy? Yeah. For po from a policy standpoint. Boy, I mean, I'll start now. I'll say that one of I guess there's a couple ways to think about it, but one of the real uses, I think, of qualitative research is to be able to, now I think about knowledge translation and dissemination all the time, that's what I'm interested in, and I find, and so qualitative research for me is often about creating, um, uh, enhancing that process um, that may be about enhancing the process of, of translation of quantitative data, so if you, uh, qualitative paper allows you, one, to bring context and meaning to quantitative results, then all of a sudden it, you have uh, a much sort of broader uh, audience. And I think po we know that policy makers respond to, don't often respond to data the way we do, right, or the way we present it. And they respond to data in ways that are uh, either integrated with meaning or come with a powerful uh, narrative or ha supply context. And so I think that you can go into a qualitative project saying, I'm going to, among other things, going to seek to develop some explanatory, uh, uh, explanatory sort of content that will help people who may not actually live in the world of, uh, of, of, of pure data um, or pure evidence be able to make some, you know, make decisions that are, that, that align with their preferences and values. Um, so, uh, so I think you can be very deliberate about it, but then on the other hand, you can also, you may be, you may be in the process of knowledge gathering where you're just trying to understand the range of ideas and perspectives, sort of like the earth, like, the, the, n not the back end, like how do you translate the, 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 the quantitative research, but how do you design the quantitative research so that it will, but you're doing, but it'll, that'll help, if you, if you do it in a way that's um, meaningful, then it will help you design your next study so that it can be translated, I Kristen think. Kristen has a in flight a in an hour and 25 minutes, no, so she's, not. an hour and a half, okay, she's gonna go. Sorry, I took five minutes off. You know, they announced at Bye. the airport that we should be there two hours early when I uh, mm -hmm. uh, landed. Thank you for come stretching your schedule to come. Come join us the flight. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, so that's my, so I think, I think you can be very deliber deliberate about it, but you can also use it to help inform the way you design uh, other types of questions it, with a, an eye towards dissemination and policy. So the one thing that I'll actually add on there that's unique about qual versus quant is that there is a huge ethical issue towards your participants. Mm -hmm. And particularly for those of us that study stigmatized populations or stigmatized issues, or who use social media in our qual, I think there are some really important and sticky issues around how we are portraying our participants' quotes and how identifiable they are. 
that does not exist. You know, in quant, you know that you don't present a cell size that's less than five, like we have the safe harbor stuff. But I think there's like a real thoughtfulness that has to go into the way that you present some of this qual stuff, particularly for things that are super identifiable. Um, and I'll just, you know, I, I, we could have a whole different, you know, two hour discussion about it. But I think that especially when you're thinking, I know your topic and I think like, <laughs> you know, you're like, oh, well, this one person from New Hampshire who mm -hmm. like blah, 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 like you Google the news and you can figure out probably who that person might be, right? Like, so there's yeah. like, um, th there, there's some concerns to think about there and what you present. Not saying that you ever, I've never known you to violate ethical standards right. to be clear, but like I just think it's an important thing to keep in mind. I just wanted to, I don't, I don't think that that's necessarily different than any potentially stigmatizing topic in quantitative research either. Like I think we, yeah. we sit behind a wall of like data anonymity, but we still have a responsibility for what we put out there in the way that it could be potentially interpreted. Um, so, so I, I think that the ethical privacy issues are probably greater, but I don't know that, you know, how it impacts policy. Like, you can still write a quantitative paper that can be easily misconstrued to support a policy you think is unjust. Oh, yes. So, <laughs> and, and it happens, you know, frequently. And so, so the, it means more to you because it's the person you've, like, listened to their voice, but it's still, whether they, you know, spoke aloud or filled out a survey, they still gave you their input and their, their you know, you have an ethical responsibility either way. Sorry to interrupt the moment. No, not at all. It's, it's great. Yeah. It's a great addition. Ashlyn. So the question is um, getting qualitative projects to the IRB and what are the particular challenges? I have very few. I mean, honestly, like for me, my IRB, uh, at this point, a lot of my qual stuff, I do waiver of written consent or it might even be exempt. Um, I'm very specific, I'm very upfront with them that I'm gonna iteratively change the interview guide or the focus group guide or whatever it is. Um, you know, if it's something that is on about a stigmatizing topic and a particular if you're doing focus groups, you're gonna have to put a little more detail in about how you're gonna kind of assure people within the focus group that they're gonna maintain confidentiality or kind of ways that you're gonna obscure identities, um, might need a certificate of confidentiality. If it's NIH funded, you get that automatically now. But if it's not NIH funded, you're going to have to apply for it separately so that anything they say that's potentially illegal activity is protected so that the police can't come and ask for it. Um, but, you know, outside of that, I, I don't have a lot of challenges. Again, this is where a good mentor can potentially, and if you have specific questions, I think we'd be happy to walk you through them. Yeah, I, I would say it's um, I, I almost similar experience to Megan's. Um, there's been, a, I think, an evolution over the even over the past 10 years mm -hmm. at my institution in terms of uh, how the uh, IRB has come to view um, qualitative, the IRB at School of Medicine has come to view qualitative research with a much more, I think, appropriate and balanced um, uh, perspective around protecting patient confidentiality, but also understanding that, for example, the interview guide that you attach to your first IRB might change and we're not putting I don't, I, we don't even put in, like every time we change oh God, it, we no. don't even put in mods. Um, mm -hmm. But we did originally yes. because like they, they were, they wanted, you know, they wanted it. And um, uh, we have nine IRBs at the Penn School of Medicine and one of them is specific oh. for qualitative <laughs> oh. um, research and is like oh, run by uh, mixed methods. And so Only they totally get it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, but once I made, we made the mistake, because sometimes you, we were doing mixed methods and it got, my research coordinator, I think sub, it was early on, submitted it to the wrong IRB and they did not get it at all and they reviewed it and it went to full, full review oh, yeah. and it was just so, so yeah, I mean, you just gotta learn the, oh, the politics. Which it. actually yeah. goes back to the publication thing. Thank you for my, this is what I was gonna say to Kristen, to the thing we were talking about with Kristen, thank you. Qual, getting Qual published, make sure that the journal you're submitting to has published Qual before. Mm -hmm. Like, don't waste your time. You know, I was up here before with Deb Dirks. Dirks she's like, circulation has never and will never publish qualitative research. Fine, done, right? So, so just know that. Like, take a little time and make sure that your journal has published it before um, would be my only other, yeah, just going back to a prior topic. Yeah. I would say that I've, I've submitted an IRB amendment when I decided to ask about things that were sensitive. So we started asking about immigration status instead of um, just country of birth because it yeah. became relevant to our patient population. Um, and so that I was like, I, I made the research coordinator submit a, an amendment for that one because I was like, that one is actually going to be an issue if that got out somewhere. Yeah, I do worry a little bit about, going back to this, um, a lot of journals are now like pr creating secondary journals um, that are pay for 
they're not pay for publication, but mm. they're open access and they, you do have to submit, mm. right? And so, for example, we recently published a paper in Medical Decision Making's Policy and Practice, which is their sort of second journal. Um, so it's linked to a high impact journal. It's got a decent impact factor, but it's still their secondary open access online. And my, from talking to an editor, like almost all the qualitative stuff that, that they are accepting now is kind of being funneled into this. Mm. So I, I, I know Annals is, is going to maybe be doing something, I don't know, maybe not, I don't know. Uh, but like one of the things we should be, I think, vigilant about is in making sure that, because I think that does sort of perpetuate some myths around the hierarchy of sort of quality yes. of, of research. and. You know, this is not low quality research. It's, um, it's so, super high. Yeah. And, and that goes back to mm -hmm. kind of my answer to, to you about kind of when to publish. Like, you want the best possible study before you publish it. Um, and you want it to really be a like groundbreaking, super cool, this adds to the literature. There is some qual that I do that I don't publish. I mm -hmm. mean, right? Like, there's just like there's some retrospective chart reviews that I do in preparation for um, a, a grant application. And, and maybe it would have been different if it were like 10 years ago, but at this point there are times when I do some data collection, particularly for intervention development, where like it's just not worth the time, and like it served its purpose, but it's just not publishable. Like it doesn't have generalizable scientific interest that's gonna advance the field. And I don't believe in public, like you need to get promoted, but there's also a, a yeah. time, and there's a time and effort component to getting right. a publication ready. So not everything you do needs to get published. I think that's right. I mean, you know, it's, I think it's an interesting question. If you've got data and you don't publish it, some people would say that's unethical, but the question yeah, if is- you use it. If it's, it has to be use, usable and meaningful. Yeah. Um, and so, um, but what do you, you know, are there, are there other things that we could do with those data that would allow people to, you know, build on it or without necessarily getting it yeah. in, in, in the. I've had two people show up to yeah. a focus group before. That's why I yeah. hate focus groups, because it <laughs> always happens. Yeah. yeah. I don't do I them do, anymore. Yeah. I hate them. Yeah. That that's okay. Yeah. You, you just have to be honest about what happened. Like yeah, I agree. the analysis techniques aren't different yeah. for for they're both interview studies. There's some slight differences in how right. you might be able to apply mixed methods analysis to it. But it I don't I've yeah, I agree. I've included them and been honest about which interviews had how many people. It's I had like one, one guy showed up. I still used his data. He sat there and gave me all his information. And yeah. Was, you know. It's like sometimes I do interviews over the phone because there's no other way to get it. Like, you know, that's a slightly different method than doing it in person, but it's better than not getting it at all. So, um, and you know what? Those people that aren't showing up probably have some reason, and so I really want to capture their data because they're probably in that outlier category, right? So, so I think that's okay. Just again, yeah, Liz said, be honest. Um. Well, we are at our time. Are there any last questions, burning questions anyone has? Well, thank you so much for coming to thank hang you. out with us on Friday. Go forth and tell stories.